have you with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. Those who are in drive-in church, welcome to you as well. Uh, don't forget, if you're in drive-in church, um, that uh, we are having the Lord's table at the end of the morning service this morning. And so uh, make sure, you're, if you're going to join us, that you uh, get uh, a little uh, sealed uh, communion cup that has the unleavened bread and uh, the grape juice in it. Uh, that'll happen, of course, at the end of the morning service. Um, uh, just a, a little update. I have two friends that are quite sick. Um, one is Dr. Phil Stringer, who was here last week. At first, they thought he had a COVID relapse. That isn't true. Then they thought that he had bird flu. Uh, there was only one other case in the United States. That was in Colorado. They tested, and that wasn't true. They thought he had a heart attack. That wasn't true. Uh, but it appears that he has uh, um, bacterial pneumonia. So be praying with him. He's uh, in um, Barrington Hospital, Barrington, Illinois. Also, I talked early this morning with my friend, Dr. Dave Sorensen. Uh, he's uh, struggling with um, uh, pneumonia as well. So I'll be, be praying for both of my two brothers. I was with them both in a conference in Washington State. And thankfully, um, I haven't come down with anything yet. I ask you to be praying for my wife, Linda. We're headed to um, uh, the doctors on Monday, uh, real upper respiratory challenges for Linda. So appreciate that. Um, prayers for, for her as well. Uh, let's um, pray and then we'll get to the seven subtleties of Satan, the fossil record. Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for all those who participated uh, in the ladies' luncheon yesterday. Uh, we're thankful for all of the coordination efforts of all the people involved and the wonderful food. And uh, Lord, we are, are, are grateful uh, for uh, the people who were here, a number of them. Uh, I don't believe no Christ as Savior. I'm grateful for uh, the way that uh, my daughter Carla wrapped things up to make it very clear. We're thankful for uh, Mrs. Simonson's testimony of uh, how she got saved and um, uh, what the Lord's doing in their life. Uh, Lord, uh, I just pray uh, as uh, Brother Krieger and I, one deacon stood at the door and handed out gospel tracts to everybody we didn't know. I just pray that they will read them, uh, that that uh, seed will be watering what they heard yesterday, and it'll uh, spring up into salvation. Uh, Lord, uh, we would just ask that you'd be with us this day, and um, as we do very often, the first Sunday of the month, uh, we remember uh, the Lord in the Lord's table, also called communion. And thank you for what you did, Jesus Christ, being obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So we have the opportunity to rejoice and be thankful. We commit all these things to you now. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. I'm continuing on with um, our series, of The Seven Subtleties of Satan, and Satan... Uh, is trying to hide biblical truths from everybody in any way possible. And we have gone through and looked at a number of those, how he tries to keep the gospel away from people, and uh, promoting the lie of evolution. Uh, some of you know uh, that I studied uh, early in my life at Central Michigan University I was going to be a geologist. Uh, I was a lifelong rock collector, uh, and um, I lived just three miles away from the biggest, at that time, the biggest gravel pit in the world. It was called American Aggregates, <clears throat> and on Saturdays, very often, I would go up to American Aggregates, and they'd have huge piles of gravel, that came from deep in the earth, and I would find things. They're back on some of them are on the table. 
things like Petoskey stones, and <clears throat> there's a city in Michigan called Petoskey, Michigan, and it's very interesting in Petoskey, Michigan, you, do you find a lot, or at least at that, that time when I was growing up and went over there from time to time, you'd find stone uh, coral uh, you, you, uh, that had uh, uh, washed up from uh, Lake Michigan, and it makes um, wonderful things. I didn't bring one up here this morning, but they're on the back of the table. It's a very interesting uh, um, arrangement of, of the coral there that's fossilized. And we found agates. And then uh, when, I don't know why my parents let me do it, uh, but when I was, I can't remember whether it was 16 or 17, my parents allowed me to take a brand new uh, Plymouth station wagon and my best friend in high school, Mike, and uh, we uh, traveled a lot of the United States. The first thing that we did was uh, uh, a stop at uh, a Mammoth Cave and uh, go on tour of Mammoth Cave. And then we explored uh, Eureka Cave in Arkansas. I have some, I've told you about some of the exciting things hanging on a rope in Eureka Cave. And then we studied uh, caves in um, Bloomington, Indiana, and I still have in my office some stalactites and stalagmites that I picked up while we were on that uh, uh, caving expedition, spelunking expedition. Uh, then uh, we traveled uh, to uh, Grand Canyon. We traveled to Yellowstone National Park six weeks, and that was before cell phones. And every other day, I had to call home to my parents uh, to let them know that we were still alive and why uh, they allowed it. But it was a great adventure that I remember yet today, visiting so many of the parks. Uh, a couple of uh, exciting things happened in Yellowstone National Park relating to bears. Uh, probably told you these stories too. Some of you might have heard them, some of you not. But uh, we had goodies in the car, and back then, the Plymouth Station Wagon we had, we'd sleep in the back of the Plymouth Station Wagon, and we'd roll down our, our windows a little bit, and then they used to have the old triangular vents that you could open to let air in. And uh, I, had, I liked Babe Ruth candy bars, and so I ate part of a Baby Ruth candy bar and put it on the, the dashboard up there, and then I heard something at 4 o'clock, maybe it was 4.30, might have even been 5 in the morning, going, claws. And I, I, I heard this noise, and there was a huge bear that had its paw through that triangular window, and it was trying to get that Babe Ruth candy bar that was sitting on there. Uh, I poked Mike, that was back then, all we had was machetes and knives, uh, didn't, didn't have guns at that time, uh, and um, uh, scared away the bear, though uh, I'm sure that the newlywed couple didn't appreciate that because it ran over into their tent uh, and uh, worked to get their cooler out. Let's just say that they ran out of their tent less than clothed, but anyway, um, the, uh, uh, I thought it was so crazy because uh, the park ranger came, somebody evidently had reported it, the park ranger came, and he got out, and I'm thinking, you've, you've got a flat coal shovel, and you're going to take on a bear with a flat, flat coal shovel? Well, he got up uh, about from here uh, to where that little black table and... Um, whatever color it is, gold table there, and he took that flat shovel and smacked it right behind the bear. It made a loud popping sound, and the bear took off. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, uh, so much for the cooler in the tent of the newlywed couple. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> the next thing, we stayed there a couple days because we were climbing the, the mountains, and back then they didn't have as many places that you couldn't go that you do now. And uh, I nearly found, uh, fell into the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone when I was uh, climbing up there, but God preserved my life in that. But 
The, there was good trout fishing, and we'd actually caught a trout for b breakfast, but somebody else had been fishing, and he had two or three trout. I can't remember how many were there, and he had them tied to his fishing pole, and he's walking back uh, to wherever his campsite was there, and out comes a bear. And the guy starts running, and bears can move pretty quickly, uh, and he's following the guys looking back, and the bear's getting <laughs> closer and closer. And I yelled, drop the fish, drop the fish, drop the fish. <laughs> Finally, he heard it. He dropped the fish. The bear didn't want him, <laughs> but the bear did want his fish. Uh, and then one last bear story before we move along here. There was, uh, we were two single guys, and uh, in Yellowstone in a Volkswagen were two single girls and um, we were we didn't date him or do anything like that but we were kind of traveling together well uh, they did have signs posted don't feed the bears and it's a good idea not to feed the bears uh, because the bears aren't always done eating when you're done feeding and one of the girls got out of the Volkswagen and so we stopped because we were conversing back and forth and the girls started feeding the bear marshmallows. And I said, that's not a good thing to do. Well, the girl uh, threw the bear five or six marshmallows. And then uh, she had kind of a long coat with uh, floppy pockets on. And she put the marshmallows in her pocket. The bear was not done eating. So the bear runs up to her and swipes rips off the side of her coat and her pocket and uh, the, the girl is white as a sheet and I'm thankful that she was alive because she was running to the car uh, and uh, the bear um, finished eating the marshmallows but if you're ever in <laughs> a park and there's bears don't feed the bears period don't feed the bears but nonetheless, um, I've been all over the United States uh, rock collecting. I picked up some beautiful crystals. Uh, when we were in Arkansas, picked up some more um, agates, beautiful agates. I still have them to this day. Uh, some beautiful agates when, when we were in Wy Wyoming and Montana. Montana, I have a, a sample of some Montana agates back there, unique type of agates. But uh, those are all the result of uh, uh, biblical creation, biblical creation. Um, I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1, and uh, we'll start right here. It says this, in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens the heaven, singular, and the earth. And then now, let's look at the days of creation. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. I'm just thinking of the power of God's word. Let there be light, and there was light. So in the first day, God saw the light. It says that it was good, and God divided the light from the the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness night now I want you to look at the 24 hour cycle in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 and the evening and the morning were the first day that does away with the day age theory my friends evening by the time you have the evening to the evening and morning you have days second day uh, God says, let the sky, let the firmament in the midst of the waters, let, 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 let me get it right, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it be divided from waters to waters. So there's waters above and waters beneath. It was very much uh, like that. And God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament of the sky from the waters which were above the firmament. 
And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters uh, under heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so. So remember, the thing started out with water covering everything, okay? And you had the waters above and the waters beneath, so ultimately you'll end up with the cycle uh, with the rain and then evaporation and so on and so forth. But So God um, has dry land, third day, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and gathered together of the waters and called uh, he seas, and God saw it and it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seeds, fruit trees yielding fruit after their kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And God brought forth grass and herb yielding seeds after his kind, and uh, uh, tree yielding fruit, uh, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw it was good, and the evening and the morning was the third day. Verse 14. On the fourth day, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, And let them be for a sign and for season and for days and for years. And let them be lights for the firmament of the heaven to give life on the earth. And it was so. I think it's very interesting that God had light and darkness even before he put the sun and the moon and the planets in their place. Um, And remember what the Bible says. Think about it a little bit. God is light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I believe that that was not only talking about his message of truth, but you know in the new heavens and the new earth, in fact, even I believe it's in the millennium, we won't have any need for Christ is the light. It's very, uh, not just uh, uh, spiritually, but uh, actually very physically. 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser to rule night. And uh, it says, and he says, he made the stars also, kind of, just kind of, yeah, made the stars. And God uh, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over day and over night and to divide light from darkness and God saw that it was good. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now on the fifth day, verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly uh, the moving creatures that hath light, the fowls that fly above the earth in uh, the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Now, once you keep seeing that, after their kind, there's no transitional. Uh, after their kind. Um, while you might have a microevolution within dogs because of breeding, uh, they're still dogs. Um, and so God created dogs as a variety of, of dogs. One of the things that's very interesting, my granddad had an apple tree um, that had um, probably 25 different apples on it. His dad had an apple tree that had 100 different apples on it. But there was no plums on the apple tree. Why? It's a different kind. It has a different seed. And God talks about the seed within. All right. And every fowl after their kind, and God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, verse 22, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning was the fifth day. Now we come to um, 
Uh, the par excellence, God said, let the earth bring forth uh, living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so when God made the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after their kind, God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in, I want you to catch this, our image. Completely different. He doesn't talk about the image, his image in anything else. Man, man is the apex of God's creation. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The other, the, the ability to think, the ability to reason, uh, the ability to know good and evil, the, vil the ability to communicate. And while it's understood that some things like whales with their squeals and their squeaks, they do communicate, um, man is the highly, most highly functioning communicative creation that God ever made. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have, here it is, all this rest of the creation, <clears throat> and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And I'm thankful for this. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over everything uh, that moveth upon the earth. Verse 29. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, and it shall be for for food, for meat, for food. Man started out as a vegetarian, all right? And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth on the earth wherein is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. I want you to understand that uh, the cow ate hay or grass, the lion ate hay or grass. The jackal ate hay or grass. The dog ate hay or grass. Because not only were human beings herbivores and not carnivores, uh, so the animals, so were the animals. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. And then um, on the seventh day, we see um, God resting. Not so much because he was tired, but because he wanted it to be an illustration that man was to be busy for six days, and on the seventh day, it was to be a day of rest and worship. It's very interesting uh, that uh, relating to the Jewish people, they were to plant crops for six years, and then they were let the ground rest on the seventh year. And they did not do that, and God judged them, and they were taken into captivity for not doing that. But it's very interesting as I... I ride my bike, it's real interesting to, to see that one year we'll have soybeans on this side of the path, and on the other side of the path is corn. On the next year, it'll be opposite. The corn will be on this side, the soybeans will be on the other, because the farmers know that if you grow the same a crop year after year after year, it depletes the soil certain minerals and soybeans add certain things that corn needs and, and, and corn adds certain things that soybean needs. 
but no farmers today, the reason we're in a lot of trouble, no farmers today are very few, uh, let their ground rest as they should every seven years. There's a reason that God designed that to, to be so. Uh, and um, it's, it's very, very uh, interesting to see how God created everything to, to work in unison. And we're going to be in big trouble this year, I, I believe, and I believe we're going to see a lot of crop shortages because uh, nitrogen that a lot of farmers use has gone from $200 a ton to nearly $1,000 a ton. Potassium from $500 a ton to about $1,500 a ton. And there's some farmers who, um, number one, can't get the fertilizer that they need. And so they're going to try and grow crops this year without the fertilizer. That'll work okay for the first year because there's some re residual there. However, uh, it won't last for a long time because they haven't let the ground rest for a long time. We're going to have diminished, we're going to have diminished um, uh, crops this year. So we're going to see things sky, skyrocket in prices. In fact, we're seeing some of that already. And a lot of people don't know it, but the Ukraine is the breadbasket for a lot of Europe and uh, it's crop planting time and they're fighting a war. There's not going to be a lot of crops planted there. There was a lot of exports uh, that are going on. So all I'm saying is when you go outside of God's plan, you're going to find yourself in, in big trouble. Now, we all know what happened in, in Genesis chapter, um, chapter 2. Um, we see that uh, Adam is uh, getting a wife. Um, and by the way, uh, just so everybody knows, and um, uh, still have freedom of speech, uh, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Uh, had it been Adam and Steve, it had been a one-generation deal because uh, you need male and female in most all species to be able to replenish the earth as God had said. Then the great problem that we have after this is called the fall of man. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we see that the curse takes place in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3. We start out seeing the temptation of uh, Satan uh, inhabiting the serpent and his temptation to Eve. Now, Eve was genuinely deceived by the serpent. And there was only one tree in all the garden. There was only one law. There was only one law, one single solitary law. They could eat of every tree in the garden. They could eat of all the herbs in the garden. <clears throat> but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were not to eat of it. Didn't say they couldn't touch it, just said they couldn't eat from it. Well, you know the true account. Eve was deceived and ate, and Adam knew better. But I presume um, that Adam didn't want to be alone and so Adam, knowing fully well, uh, took up the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by the way, I'm going to uh, take a segue here. I do not believe that the fruit on the tree was an apple. Uh, we used to sing a little camp song. The Lord, he thought he'd make a man, dim bones are going to rise again. So he took a little water and he took a little sand, dim bones are going to rise again. He put them in a garden, cool and nice, and he called that garden paradise. Dim bones are going to rise again. And it all goes through the creation process, and then it tells a lie. It says, Eve got the apple and Adam got the core. <laughs> 
We used to laugh at that and tease the girls. But um, you know who brought sin into the world? Uh, Eve was deceived and she fell. But it was a man knowing full well that he shouldn't eat and he ate. And that's what brought sin upon the entire human race. And just in case you think uh, that work is a result of the curse, that's not true. Uh, it says very clearly that God put them in the garden to dress and keep it. So perhaps he, like my granddad would do in the spring, he'd trim the grapes, prune the grapes, he'd uh, thin the apples, he'd do all those, all those things. So they kept up the garden, uh, but it, it wasn't a, a horrible thing. What sin did is brought the curse. And thorns and thistles, weeds come. How many of you ever done a garden? Man, keeping up the weed with the weeds is, I don't know where they come from, but the weeds are much more powerful than a lot of times. Uh, last year I planted some tomatoes. I didn't have a whole lot of extra time, and the weeds almost overtook the tomatoes. I didn't get a very good tomato crop because I wasn't out there to pull out the weeds. Uh, in the situation. Now you say, you're taking a, a long way around things. All I'm, all I'm just saying is uh, that what happens is that because of sin and because they turned away from God, violence comes to fill the entire earth. Uh, and um, as a result of the violence, uh, God is just fed up with that violence, and um, he is going to send a worldwide flood. As uh, we move on, we come to uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7, uh, we see in verse 8, Genesis chapter 6, but I'm going to look at verse 1 first. It says, And it came to pass when man began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. So let's just go back a little bit. I, I get this stupid question from time to time. It's such a stupid question. Where did Cain get his wife? Well, it's it's easy. He married his sister. There wasn't the ge genetic pollution because even when uh, we read about this, we, we see that Adam and Eve had other children uh, than what we uh, are named originally. But it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them um, uh, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were fair, and they looked on them, and they came unto them. And um, it says in verse 4, and it says, And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children unto them. And the same became mighty men, uh, which were of old men of renown. And verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of the men was great in the earth, and that, look at this now, it all starts in your head. Don't, don't kid yourself. Evil starts in your head, okay? And God saw the wickedness of men was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The, the, they weren't seeking after God. There was none that seek, sought after God. There are just a few. We'll see that there's one man in his family. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. See, God made all of that uh, for man to have fellowship, to have a beautiful place, and man messes it up. 
Man decides to go his own way. Man is just filled with, with uh, uh, jealousy, with greed, bloodthirsty. I'm thankful for one man, Noah. I told somebody, I can trace my lineage back uh, thousands of years. Oh, really? Well, so can you. Noah. Noah. Uh, Noah is, and do you know what? Since they have followed the genetic code, this is true, they followed the genetic code, and they find, find out, though they don't name it, but there was two common ancestors. I think D DNA is a very interesting thing. I keep finding out more and more and more about DNA. Uh, I thought I was uh, primarily Irish. However, my granddad said we were Scottish, and I am 49% Scottish and only 22% Irish. But nonetheless, and the rest of that is English, a little bit of German, and a little bit of Cherokee. Uh, but the, the, fact of the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, uh, DNA has, has really kicked in the head um, evolution, my friends. And Noah, verse uh, 8 of chapter 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. And uh, God calls Noah uh, to... Um, uh, build an ark it says in verse 12 god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt and all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth and god said unto noah the end of all flesh is come before me for the earth is filled with violence uh, through them and behold i will destroy them with the earth verse 14 Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Nobody knows for sure what gopher wood is, but it was pre prevalent in that day. And I, I had a kick out of my dad. Uh, we used to cut trees when I was a kid um, in my dad's general contracting business. And um, you know, we would always keep and dry the hardwood. We would dry the... Uh, keep the red oaks, the, the white oaks, and, and if the white oaks were good, we'd have them sawed into lumber. Cherry, if the cherry is good, we'd have it sawed into lumber. A hickory, if the hickory is good, we'd saw into lumber, but you'd still have a lot, but we would keep and split all the hardwood and pile it in one place. Uh, then when we would cut down a basswood tree or we'd cut down a willow tree or some of the other softwood trees, we'd also split that and let it dry, but God called that, or God, Dad called that gopher wood. And I said, why is that gopher wood? He says, don't you know by now? He says, you start the fire with gopher wood, and if you don't put hardwood on it, which lasts a while, if you just feed it with gopher wood, you put some in, and then you have to go for more right away. <laughs> so that's why he called it gopher wood. It's not the same as the Bible gopher wood, but it sticks out in my head, because that's true. The soft wood, if you put it in the fireplace, or in ours, we had a round oak uh, stove in the basement. Uh, you'd put that soft to get it started, and then the hardwood you'd put on, and it would last a whole lot longer. But, and so they'd make an arc of, of gopher wood, and they put uh, probably uh, uh, conifer or pine uh, pitch to seal the cracks inside and outside not just inside but inside and outside it sealed the cracks and so they made an ark and it gives uh, it gives the dimensions of the ark in verse 17 and said behold i even i do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, uh, the fact of the matter is, if, if you continue to read the account, going to verse 7, um, the Bible talks about a global flood. A global flood. That means it, it covered the highest mountains... In that day, it covered the highest mountains that were there. It covered 
the entire earth. And I think it's really strange as I was taking my um, uh, ge geology courses, they would talk about floods, but they would always frame them as being local floods. How, however, uh, in their teachings, and we're going to come and see it in a little bit here, uh, they would talk about a, a geologic column. And we'll talk about that in just, just a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to my geology days, and it's going to get a little bit technical this week and next week, but you need to understand uh, the, the geologic column. And in, in relationship to the geologic column, they would say things like, um, um, this is, is a sand dollar, and uh, this is a, um, a petrified, fossilized sand dollar, uh, this is a huge trilobite, and they would say that these are the oldest in the evolution, so they would say it would be on the very, very bottom uh, of the supposed geologic column of fossils because they would say that things evolved, and then, then next on, on the geologic column, you'd have things like flowers and so on and so forth. These are fossilized flowers from my collection here. And then as things would move up and get to the next layer, next layer, this is a petrified stick. This is petrified wood. They would say that would be in the next column. And then you'd have, this is a, a megalodon. This is a, a shark's tooth, a huge shark's tooth. They would say that. And then they would say as things get newer, you'd have things like uh, dinosaur bones, still millions, but you get down here and you have multi-millions and all this kind of stuff. And um, then, they would, they, then they would say, I didn't bring it up, but I have a mastodon tooth back on the table. Towards the top, the youngest would be mastodon. And, and so they would say, you can see evolution by the uh, geologic column. Um, I want to tell you that is a bald face lie. And I will prove it to you. We'll get into it a little bit today. But um, the question is, um, we'll start out with a little bit of levity. Who was the shortest man in the Bible? Well, uh, here it was. There's two possibilities, but I think it was Bildad the Shuhite. See, there he is. There's Bill Dad. And <laughs> and, or if it wasn't Bill Dad, the shoe, shoe height uh, in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, uh, Peter slept on his watch. So, um, you know, he went to sleep on. Well, never mind. Never mind. Let's just let's, let's get away from that. <laughs> you know, I know. I know. Two thirds of a pun. P U. Okay, I understand. Um, but there, there are two views. There are two views of the fossil record. Now, uh, in our Bibles, we see in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7, um, this. Knowing this first, uh, that there shall come in the last days scoffing, uh, I, I remember uh, getting in a lot of trouble with my geology professor because he was talking about the evolution of man and given some illustrations, and I wasn't thinking very good. And I said, well, you know what? Uh, evolutionists tell lies oftentimes because you talk about the evolution of man and the missing links. You talk about Piltdown Man. I said Piltdown Man's been proven to be developed from a pig's tooth and a partial jaw. It's a fake. And um, he wasn't real happy with me. I probably should have kept my mouth shut. But nonetheless, scoffers in the last days walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue 
as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, we just read this, by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the waters and in the waters, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. You know what that's saying? Worldwide flood, the world that was. The world's about 6,000, 6,500 years old, about 4,400, 4,500 years ago, there was a global flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh, I'm just telling you this. God created the world about 6,000, 6,500 years ago. And then, because of the evil of men, God destroyed it about 4,400 or 4,500 years ago and brought it back to life, but God's going to do away with it again because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And just as God created it and just as God destroyed it, and there is evidence of the flood, he's going to do it again. So are you prepared to meet God? I mean, God is, we'll see it in the morning, uh, uh, evening service, when we look at El Shaddai, God is a promise-keeping God. What God has promised, he is able and will perform. He says he created it. He warned that he was going to destroy it. He did destroy it. Then he replenished it, and he says... He is going to destroy it again and create all things new. And I just have the faith to believe it. Scoffers choose to ignore the evidence. Um, as I just said, we just read about the six days of creation. We just read about the flood. We just read about God's coming judgment and if you have your Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, six books in Joshua, um, chapter one, or no, Joshua chapter four, verse one through seven. In Joshua chapter four, verse one through seven. And it came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, were, were clean, passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of, uh, out of every tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Verse 4, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared <clears throat> of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God, into the midst of the Jordan, walk into the middle of the Jordan, and take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That'd be 12. It says, <clears throat> that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, what meaneth these stones? Then ye shall answer them, The waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the water stopped so they could take the Ark through on dry ground. The waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord 
when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel. They're going to ask, what do these stones mean? What do these stones mean? They piled them up there, and it was for the purpose of asking a question, and then they would tell them about the miracle of God. Well, that brings me to the alleged uh, geologic column, uh, 12 supposedly slabs of rock. And I already pointed out, uh, oh, has that been gone the whole time? Oh, goodness. <laughs> so you haven't been able to see the pictures. Well, that's wonderful. Um, we will start here uh, the next time uh, we're together. But let me put up the geologic column if I can in just uh, a moment. Let's see if we can do it. All right. Let's see if it comes up. I should have looked over my shoulder the whole time because I had pictures for the whole thing. What meaneth these stones? We're coming to it. There we go, right there. The next time t we're together, we're going to look at the geologic column. Uh, supposedly, as I was uh, showing you, uh, supposedly here we, we have uh, 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 4,500 million years ago. Um, you have all of these things uh, in the lowest column, like uh, trilobites and like sand dollars, like I was showing you here. That's called the Precambrian. And then there's uh, some things in the Cam Cambrian and then the or Ordovacian. Uh, you move up and you supposedly have some big animals and stuff, uh, uh, fish in the Solarian and then the Devonian in the Carboniferous and then the, uh, the Permian and uh, you have some uh, early dinosaurs and then the Jurassic and then with a lot of the movies, the Jurassic where a lot of the dinosaurs are and you come up and, and, and you have uh, quaternary, you have some of the mammoths and uh, the buffalo, some of the old ones and all that sort of things. This is the world's supposed support for evolution, but it is a lie. Do you know, and we'll show you the next time we're together, the only place on earth where the geologic column exists, the only place on earth where the geologic column exists is in evolutionary textbooks. That's the only place on earth that exists. And I'll prove it to you the next time that we're together. I'm just telling you that we can believe what's in this book. We can believe that about 6,000 to 6,500 years ago, God created it all. We can believe about 4,400, 4,500 years ago that a global flood covered the entire earth. And as much as evolutionists try and deny that, they are literally freaked out about the soft tissue that they have found in dinosaurs because dinosaur soft tissue, let's get up here, dinosaur soft tissue, let's, uh, let's go right here, um, 144 million years ago to 65 million years ago, it wouldn't still be soft tissue. Hmm. Do you know they've extracted the DNA and they're working now to try and bring back to life 
a dinosaur? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that they'll be successful, but they have the DNA and they know exactly what it is. And the DNA, which is encapsulated, could last for 4,500 years, but it couldn't last for, well, 144 million years. And by the way, I'm going to expose the lie of carbon-14. Do you know that the half-life of a carbon molecule, the oldest that carbon-14 can possibly determine is about 5,400 years old. That's about how the, the, the longest... And you, do you know what they do when they don't get the result they want? They throw it out. And so there's so much, just like what's going in our government today, in the scientific realm, it's just like what they're doing today, they say, believe the science. Well, they don't believe the, the science because the science says that you're either XX or XY. That's it. Occasionally, there's an exception to the rule. Occasionally, very occasionally. But you're either XX female or you're XY male. That's it. You can add things. You can cut things off. You can take hormone treatments. But you're either XX or you're XY. They don't believe the science. They don't believe the science at all. They lie. And the only place that the geologic column exists in the world is a science textbook. We'll pick up here, and I'll make sure that the slides are actually showing on the screen next week uh, with slide number 19. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word that explains uh, so many things to us. Uh, Lord, what do these stones mean? We'll look at that next time we're together. Pray that you be with us now. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thanks. Uh, you are dismissed until the morning service.